If you own a Mopa fiber laser, there's a good chance you were sold on the ability to mark colors on stainless steel and titanium. I was too. And if you're like me, you've probably struggled to get the colors you want or the vibrancy that you see in those demonstrations. You go through YouTube videos, you copy settings, look all over the internet, and never quite get the results you want. I'm here to help fix that. Lightburn has released a version of their software that works with Galva lasers to replace EasyCAD 2, and it has a feature called Material Test. You make a grid, adjust settings, uh, it makes things much easier to explore. I'm gonna share with you my experiments and my results, as well as some of the conclusions that I've come to that really help me find the colors that I like. My name's Geo, and welcome to Maker Theory. Starting with a new document here in Lightburn, I'm gonna go up to Laser Tools on the top menu and down to Material Test on the bottom. So this is gonna be our control center for the material testing. I'm gonna start by changing the height of my box to three millimeters. I'm gonna go ahead and shift this up a little bit because I don't want it straight down under the lens because I'm doing a, a light mark. And then my width to two millimeters. Uh, these are the sizes that fit pretty good on these little dog tags. So that's where we'll start. So on the bottom left, you'll have your cut parameters. And this is where we're gonna make our changes to what we wanna test with. So I'm gonna leave speed alone because I'm gonna use that as one of my variables. But max power, I'm gonna pump it up to 90. I'm gonna change uh, frequency to 125. And my pulse, we're gonna go with uh, 15 here. My crosshatch, well, I wanna remove crosshatch. And the hatch spacing I'm gonna leave alone because again, it's gonna be one of my variables. The reason I'm doing this is I want something that I know is going to mark the material. I don't know how well it's going to mark, but it's going to mark something. So let's take a look. And it looks a little bit big. I've run this test before, so I'm going to change this to 8 count uh, on X and 8 count on Y. And that should give me uh, good spacing and fit on my little tag that I've got. So speed, I'm gonna go ahead and leave that there. So vertically we'll have speed. Now horizontally, as we go across our grid, I want it to be interval. So this is gonna be changing the distance, uh, your hatch spacing essentially is what it is. So I'm gonna give these really broad ranges because I'm just looking for a wide range of marks. And from there, I'm gonna dial it in so that looks better. And that should fit well on the little dog tags it had. So I'm gonna go ahead and frame it. All right, I'm gonna save you the pain of having to listen to that because you're gonna have uh, plenty of that to listen to as you're running these tests yourself. I sped this up to four times speed just to get it through the video, you can watch it. And here we'll slow down this last one. So this one's really slow. It's our slowest setting, 100 millimeters per second. Also running with a 0 0.005 millimeter line spacing. So uh, quite painful. So we're gonna go ahead, uh, the setting's gonna the test is going to run all your marks on there to tell you what it is you're actually getting. So that's the nice thing about this test is you don't have to label anything. It does it for you. So it'll tell you what your uh, your each line column is. It'll tell you which row is, uh, what speed it is. It'll tell you, um, you know, what it is the parameter it's changing as well as what the fixed parameters are up at the top. So let's take a closer look. This looks nothing like what I intended. Definitely a lot, uh, too much power, and I really don't care for how the side has uh, the grid, uh, or the, the spacing is off. So I'm gonna go ahead and make some changes.
first thing I'm going to do is change my intervals. So that way we have equal uh, 100 millimeter per second changes because I'm OCD. I like the nice round numbers. I'm also going to drop my Q pulse in half and I'm going to drop my power down to uh, 80 here. Normally I recommend only doing one parameter at a time, but that was pretty extreme. So I'm, I'm just making a jump at, uh, and making some changes. So let's do a preview, make sure everything changed. Got nice round numbers on the left, so I'm happy. Hit okay, and we'll do it again. Oh, before we do that, let's go ahead and save this. So if you click on the little uh, floppy disk, uh, save icon there, it'll pop up this preset name. So we can go ahead and type in what it is. I'm gonna type in that it's a speed versus hatch. This is gonna be your color grid because that's what I'm trying to find. And we'll hit okay. So now I can click on that drop down and be able to select uh, that again if I were to do it again. So let's run this one again. I'll uh, go ahead and spare the sound. We're running it at four times uh, speed just so we can get it done and over with and see what the results are. So there's a lot better result. Uh, we actually got some colors, which is the goal of this. Let's take a closer look, pick it up. These are uh, a nice shimmery color. So we'll take a kind of look at them in the light here. Sorry for the uh, lack of focus. I fixed the focus on this camera, but we'll take it over to the light box here and take a look at it and see what we have. Yeah, so those are some pretty nice looking colors, a little bit of range, not a, a full rainbow range, but it looks like we have some, some nice colors. So what I'm gonna do next is select one of those colors and kind of zoom in on the settings that, that uh, I used or that, that resulted in that particular color. And we're gonna run another test. So we'll go down to edit our settings. This time I'm gonna lock it at 700 millimeters per second. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go after that blue that was on the top left. So now I'll be changing the left side to my interval. I'm gonna change the right side to Q pulse just to see what it does. Um, go ahead and make some Save this again. And we'll put in a little more specific of what I'm targeting. So I'm going for that blue and mistype there was 700 millimeters per second is really what I wanted to say. Hit okay and that'll now save it to our drop down. So we want to run this test again on another piece of material. We can do that. Here's my new uh, spacing much tighter uh, interval. This one is a much slower mark than the last one, uh, just because our interval is so tight, uh, such a small range. Uh, so I went ahead and bumped it up to eight times speed. We're using the M1 uh, JPT MOPA 30 watt with a 254, F254, so 175 by 175 uh, work area OPEX lens. And honestly, this is not quite the result I was expecting. Um, I did get color, so that's good. Uh, regardless, we did get uh, additional colors, so that's good. Uh, we're getting closer to what we're ultimately trying to achieve is uh, a range of colors. Let's take a look at it under the box here. And it's a, a decent looking range there. We got some blues, we got some browns, uh, some light blues, a yellow, kind of mustard yellow, and it's like a maroon, kind of reddish. Um, I guess they're all right, it's a start. 
All right, to save you a lot of time and boredom, I went ahead and ran a bunch of these samples, spent hours on this looking at uh, different ways to change the settings, parameters, to get uh, different colors, different results. What I found is there's very uh, there's several ways to get colors. Uh, some of them involve a very high frequency, uh, and it's more of a almost a, a melting of the color, so that bottom row there uh, on that right uh, bottle opener those are a very high intensity it, it looks really cool it's got that rainbow effect that you see on like a titanium exhaust or a stainless steel exhaust on a car the one up above it was a, a much lighter setting so it was a lower frequency with a very low pulse width in order to get some more traditional color i've got some honorable mentions that honestly i, I love the colors on these these are uh, 316 stainless or 16 gauge so 16th of an inch thick i honestly have been trying to chase some of those settings and it turns out that my lens was out of focus uh, which is very aggravating those were done with my 175 lens but again out of focus so i haven't been able to duplicate them because i didn't realize i was out of focus when i did them some of those like that red on the bottom left the blue and teal on some of those bottom rows are really some of the colors i, I really like the vibrancy and the pop of them uh, and i'm still trying to find those other things I experimented with in my testing was material finish. So I've got a bright anneal stainless on the left and a mill finish uh, tag on the right. If you look, you can see for the most part, they're pretty close, except for the bottom two rows really stand out. Uh, that second from the bottom uh, blue versus the yellow on the one. And I thought it was a material finish. And you'll see on this uh, next clip that it may have been another focus issue, like on those circles. So I've got on the bottom right, 17.4 uh, stainless, and that's quarter inch thick with a, a real rough grain. I've got the mill finish on the left, which doesn't match. Um, I didn't have the bright anneal in here just because it, it didn't really fit in the light box very well. Um, but the bottle opener matches the 17.4 and the bright anneal. In case you're wondering why I have two samples that are the same on the bottle opener, that's because they were both done at t different temperatures. The one on the left was chilled down to 7 degrees C, 45 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, the one on the right was 122 degrees Fahrenheit, or 50 degrees C. So here's another one, uh, just playing with different settings and experimenting. This one on the left, uh, I got a little crazy and tried it with a wobble. It was 41 minutes to do that tag. It did demonstrate how light of uh, power is it being absorbed into these materials because there's little to no warping on that tag. Now, if you'll notice the middle two, they look very similar. That's because I figuring out that the pulses, the number of pulses per square uh, it really dictated more of the color change than uh, than power or uh, the Q pulse. You'll see this where I've got uh, more of the rainbow going diagonal and the top right and the bottom left actually have the same number of pulses calculated to be in each one of those squares as each other. So you should just see a straight line going right across uh, diagonally that's showing the change. Now this one I went and went back to Q pulse and I went to bigger jumps just to see if I could get a change with Q pulse and there's a little bit of a change but honestly the number of pulses in a given area it really changed the color more so than increasing the the pulse width all right so after lots of experimentation playing with different materials different material temperatures different material finishes uh, and a couple different lenses, I've got a few conclusions that I've come to. First, material temperature doesn't seem to make a difference. I run the parts at freezing temperatures, I've run them at elevated heated temperatures, and the results, quite honestly, were the same. I've run them with different finishes, and the finishes came out with very similar results. I've tried increasing pulse width once I find a setting, and while it does make a difference, it's not as drastic as I would expect. So what are the key elements? Number one, it's going to be your focus. Make sure your focus is dead on. If you want repeatability, you have to have a very consistent focus. Number two, lens size. 
it's easier going to a bigger lens. It gives you a little bit more range and a little bit more adjustment on your settings without getting out of that range. So it gives you a, a wider range of settings to really fine tune these colors. And once you find a color, stick with the power, stick with the pulse width, start playing with your speeds and your frequencies to start adjusting your colors. It seems to have more effect with the number of pulses in a given square or given area than power has an effect on it. Uh, there are some exceptions. Obviously, the, I had some that were very sparkly and some that uh, so it left a, a very more of a rougher surface and some that were very smooth. But once you find the setting that gives you a smooth mark or a sparkly, glittery kind of look, leave your power alone leave your pulse width alone and start playing with your speed and your frequency and you'll start seeing a wider range of colors within that similar grouping. Another takeaway is be patient. These colors are very very fine marks and they're not the easiest to find but they're definitely a lot easier with this material test feature with Lightburn Galvo. I've played with my laser for a couple years now and honestly, I've not been able to get some of the colors that I've managed to create uh, in the, the few hours of testing in the last two years. This is something that's new um, and very exciting because I was very disappointed that I couldn't get some of those colors that I've seen online. So don't be afraid to experiment. Once you find something, play with it, see where it goes, and then maybe jump the power try a different setting altogether and see what else you can find. Uh, there's not one right way to do this. Um, it seems like there's uh, multiple ways to get a color and they are slightly different depending on how you approach it. So have fun with it. If you like this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. If you found it helpful, uh, leave a comment. Let me know what you liked, what you didn't like, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks. If the traditional like and subscribe isn't enough for you, feel free to follow the links in the description below to find out how you can reach out to me, learn more, as well as find out how to support the channel through my website, products, as well as Patreon. I greatly appreciate the support and look forward to making more videos in the future.